What do you guys think of the gentleman? <laughs> would you look at the procession of power we have on that left-hand stage right aisle? Uh, guys, why don't you come up? I can't really see from the, from the, from the stage lights, but I, I, I see Guy there. Come on down. Maybe let's just join these chairs. How about the, how about the cast? I see Charlie. I, I see Matthew. I see the, a man named Hugh. Michelle. Oh, my goodness. Where do we begin? Guys, uh, congratulations. It is a wonderful film. It was a joy to watch. And now let's just, let's just tear into it. Um, I'm going to... The auteur himself is uh, to my rights. Uh, I would like to start just talking about the process for coming up with this type of a story. So my favorite of your works are when you have complete control and you're writing and directing as you are now. So um, tell me about where a story like this comes from. Is there always like a kernel of an idea? Is there, is there a bit of truth? Is there a bit of history in your own life? Or is it all out of... The cranium. I think it's all of the above, actually. Um, but it's anything that there's various things, particularly with, uh, I suppose, within an English culture, that stimulate you. And there are contradictions and paradoxes, and they stimulate you. And when you find this, I'm not anti the class system, incidentally, because there's there's weird things that that happen within it, and you can look at it as a negative thing. But it's, if you don't look at it as a negative thing, it, interesting things happen. And it's the contradictions and, and the paradoxes of, of how those two worlds meet. Somehow the middle class, we all sort of aspire to be the middle class, but somehow the most interesting aspect of class is the upper echelons and the lower echelons because that's where all the interesting stuff happen. And I, I suppose that's what... I find stimulating about narrative is is trying to reconcile the the vortex in between those disparities because ultimately what we're after is some kind of equilibrium but it's you can have a lot of fun trying to find that equilibrium um, so I think I'm principally inspired by contrast and things that should be should sit uncomfortably with us but there's, there's, I think we need to go on that journey. And I think on that journey of trying to reconcile these disparate parts, you have a lot of fun. And I think if you don't have fun, you're, gonna have a, you're not going to have any fun at all. <laughs> and so there's so many little nuggets and details with, within your films, uh, you, whether it's uh, your business, Michelle, or just... Uh, um, uh, your business, Matthew, um, which is a very different business, uh, but uh, both very profitable, it seems like, from the film. Um, uh, in terms of coming up with the, the granular nature of the, the, the texture of the film, uh, uh, is, is that um, your own personal experiences or just your, your again, kind of your, your imagination? I don't have to answer that. Oh, I can sorry, that was me. Yeah, yeah, I'm I going realize. back to you. I, I I'm go, I, right up. after this, I'm going I'm, down the line. Sorry, Next question know. for Matthew. Right. Next question for Charlie. Well, it's it's where everybody's going to play. It's going to be fun. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, it, oh, it's, yeah, I just feel as I'm going to repeat myself. That's the only problem with uh, answering that question, is it feels like a repetition of the first you one. Can, you can veto any question out of my mouth that doesn't hit your standard. You can say, Tim, that's, that's really not... That's not up to my standards, so it's time for Matthew's question. Time for Matthew's question. All right, here we go. <laughs> Matthew. Um, Tim. I had, two, I, I, had two, I had two questions for you, um, and one of them was a little bit convoluted and I feel might be lost in translation. I'm going to go straight into like the easier question. And uh, so I'm thinking about um, uh, Beach Bum, and I'm, I'm going into this movie. I, wanna, I want you to maybe talk about um, is your... What's your relationship with weed, and uh, and is that a factor in deciding your thespian roles? And you know, same that rules a, apply. That's a straightforward. Shitty question. question. Pass the mic. No, but. great question. I don't know how good my answer will be. Uh, 
beach bum and the gentleman. What's my relationship with weed? And do I make my choices as a thespian based on that? <laughs> Uh, I guess I gave a good answer. And there. by the way, your your whiskey, by the way, uh, Long Branch is very lovely. Thank you for thank you. Yeah. Been unapologi unapologetically, shamelessly plugging it all day long. Um, no, I don't. Really, I don't really think about weed when I'm uh, making a choice <laughs> for 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 a role. Um, yeah, so Beach Bum was a, a a partaker, a consumer of weed and everything else. Uh, this 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 role was the heavy. He was the businessman. He's been making a living on it, and he's not one that even takes from his own stash. A um, little bit of what Guy was talking about. He's an American who's come over to sell England to the English. And it's very true, you know, sometimes when people come from outside of our, our homeland or even our homes and our, where we live, they can point something out that's really interesting or find an angle with how to make things work that we wouldn't notice because we live there. Um, and that's what, that's what Mickey did. Um, yeah, he doesn't take from his own stash. Uh, he's, he's, uh, uh, and to go back on the beach bum, yeah, I got asked today, uh, did you get high on, did y'all get high on set? And I said, no. And they said, well, you did on beach bum. I said, well, yeah, but that was the story of Snoop. Um, and I got Snoop. No, um, on this one, not that I know of. Um, <laughs> That's about as much as I've taken. That is a totally acceptable for my answer. <laughs> and so just so you know, there's a more cerebral question coming down the pike for you down the road. That if, wasn't the cerebral No, that was very pretty far from okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on down the road, uh, uh, Charlie. Uh, I want to I know about um, the origin of your relationship uh, with Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And does it uh, start with this guy? And the idea of uh, perhaps becoming a badass muse of the indomitable Mr. Guy Ritchie? Uh, or is it just sort of a health and fitness thing? Uh, where did it all come from and, and, and what's your relationship with it now? Uh, yeah, I think it did come from uh, Guy and his uh, right-hand man, Ivan, that are both avid practitioners of jiu-jitsu. Um, also, Purple, who is um, Simon Simon Hayes, Simon. Yeah, well, Purple Hayes. Yeah. yeah, Purple Hayes, right? Simon Hayes. Yeah. He's our sound man. He just happens to be called Purple Hayes. Yeah, who uh, who is also um, was the sound man on King Arthur. Who was talking a lot about jujitsu. So I got interested, went and had a bit of a roll around, and thought it was terrible fun, and um, continued on my own. It's been it's a tough thing. I was just was in India. I was doing very well this year. I was you know going four or five times a week, and you know getting pretty tasty again. I'd gotten tasty and then I took a little break from it and then I was getting tasty again and then went to India for five months and there wasn't a lot of opportunity to get my jiu-jitsu on. So, you know, I do it when I can. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an attempt to be Guy Ritchie's muse necessarily, <laughs> but um, I figure maybe I, I, I already am. I don't know, without the jiu-jitsu. I mean, we're two films in, so there's, there's something, something of a relationship there. So, Hugh, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you about weed or jujitsu. Um, I mean, I can. If you have anything to add to that subject, you're welcome to sort of improv on those lines. Um, but uh, so in, in thinking about this moment right here, right now, this Q&A, I decided to uh, go ahead and um, reacquaint myself with your entire career. And uh, I didn't watch all the movies, but I watched every single trailer uh, from every single film. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when I, when I was younger, in the 90s, there was this Hugh Grant persona, right? It was the sort of incredibly handsome, uh, but maybe a little bit nervous, uh, sort of uh, maybe sometimes stuttering, but damn charming individual. And then I contrasted it to where you are in the Guy Ritchie universe, and it's, it feels like you've... Uh, transcended, not transcended, the wrong, wrong verb, uh, moved in a parallel path into sort of this seasoned Michael Caine-esque, like, really salty individual that is very alien from the Hugh Grant of the 90s. Which do you like better? I am more comfortable uh, <laughs> being revolting, uh, <laughs> to be honest. And all actors are, and I don't really know why. I, 
except that the camera seems to sort of eat it up. Um, it's a weird thing. The camera loves... It's very... It can pick up truth. And I think the nasty truth about human beings is that we are revolting and that niceness <laughs> is just a tiny, thin veneer on top. And it's very difficult to be interesting for the camera if you're playing a nice guy. You've had to, you've had to play nice guys. It's not easy, is it? Yeah, much easier to be vile. <laughs> I like that answer. I like that answer too. And I got to say, this is my own personal opinion. I, I love, I love four weddings and a funeral, Hugh Grant. I really do. I've been with you your whole career. Um, I don't love it quite as much as what you just portrayed on screen. I like vile Hugh Grant. So kudos. Four, four weddings would have been very interesting if Fletcher had been leading the character. <laughs> he would have just messed up, messed up further the whole show. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, uh, so uh, Michelle, I so full disclosure, my wife Carrie is here. And she gave me a list of about 20 Downton Abbey questions that she wanted me to ask, but I, I, I didn't think it was necessarily appropriate. So I've sort of, I've wedged in a partial Downton Abbey, if it's okay. And again, same rules apply. I like Downton Abbey, so um, crack on. So um, the question, and, and I apologize if I'm being too long-winded about this, but there's some context to set up. Um, uh, uh, Peter Laurie. Um, uh, was plagued with his, his, ho his whole life of uh, being conflated with his on-screen persona. And people would see him in the street and spit at him. And, and, uh, 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 and, and not that Lady Mary is at all bad, but she can be a little bit high-spirited at times. Yeah. Uh, um, and, but does that, does that happen to you? And do you worry about that in success uh, uh, of... Um, being, spot. being spit upon. <laughs> and it's not a good. Now that I say it, it's not a good question. So you can sort of e extrapolate that. No, I. Um, I mean, there is part of that that I understand. You know, playing someone like Mary, particularly in those, you know, episodes where she was vile to her sister and other characters. And uh, I have had people, you know, react to me in a certain way. When they meet me, I once had this woman in a theatre who turned to me and said, "Ooh, you're a bitch, aren't you?" Yeah. <laughs> it should be nicer to your sister. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's some, I certainly, you know, have had some reactions like that. I mean, I think you know, there are people sort of assume that I, you know, like characters that you become, you know, that you play, you mm. you, you may be very much like them, which I'm, you know, nothing like her. Um, which I think came as a bit of a surprise to Guy um, <laughs> um, when considering me for this role. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that is something that I definitely relate to. <laughs> and I, I, I adore the, uh, the character in this film because there's a, there's a little bit of a, a turn, right? Because there's, there's biases and stereotypes that come played in the front, uh, but then you turn out to be you know, quite wonderful and uh, a great partner um, to this particular gentleman here. Um, and uh, that's not the question. The question is for both of you. That's such a badass business. Does that business exist? Or is that out of your straight line? I'm going back to the same old goddamn question. But uh, No, no, the business exists. That does? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Um, so, uh, so, I, and I feel like I might be getting repetitive, and people might need to shut me off. We might go to the questions from the audience here a second. Uh, but Henry, uh, so um, uh, two of your biggest successes have been from the most charming human being, uh, the uh, heartthrob. But in this movie, you are a complete asshole. Um, yeah, and it kind of goes back to Hughes a little bit. Uh, that's an exciting move. Uh, in the future, in your career, are you going to be a heartthrob or are you going to be an asshole? Can we have a bit of both? You can have both. You can have both. Can we have a bit? Of both? Where, yeah. But where does your heart guide you? My heart guides. Um, I'd be lying if I if I said that I didn't enjoy every minute 
of waxing lyrical on guys uh, on saying the C-bombs and, and the F-bombs and, and stepping into shoes that aren't necessarily ours. And I think that's the greatest joy as an actor is you get to live out those fantasies that aren't perhaps socially sort of accepted or, or, or correct. And um, to be honest, for me, it was the winning thought really was heading down to the pub and telling my mates that I was in a Guy Ritchie film. We grew up with with Guy's films, with Snatch and, and Lockstock, and to be able to portray one of those like iconically horrid characters, um, it was it was amazing. So, if we can pepper pepper the career with some some wonderful characters and and you know and step into huge shoes once in a while and and really become a, a horrid sort of character, that'd be that'd be brilliant. Um, so uh, we're going to open up the questions uh, to the audience, and um, I will uh, I will give us all the power. If the question is just kind of lame, uh, then we'd, we're going to go on to the next question, right? We don't we don't have to answer any any lame question except for the ones that have already been asked, and those are like a piece of history at this point. So does anybody have any questions for anybody in the audience? And so bear with me because there's there's 13 other cities that are are with us tonight. So What's after up, you after you uh, ask your questions, and I, I was not pointing at you, sir, because giving you the idea that you're going to be the first question, I'm willfully not going to choose you now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to repeat the question, and then we'll decide as a democratic forum if it's worthy of answering, and then we'll maybe answer it. Okay. Only awesome questions here. You, sir, in the red shirt. I'm sorry. You're next. Yeah. Uh, my question is mainly for, for Guy. Uh, soundtracks are, are so important for all your films, especially this one. There's so many musical moments. And if, if you could choose one song to use for a Oh, hey. oh, I don't have to repeat the question. Look at this. Cool. There's a microphone. We've got all high tech all of a sudden. All right. It's got so much more nerve wracking. Uh, soundtracks are so important in all your films, and especially this one. I mean, the, the Roxy Music song and all that, isn't there? Is there ever a point where, is it more that you hear a song sometimes and you conceive of a scene, or you write the scenes and then always go back later and find a song? What's the, the balance there? I think it's a bit of both. Um, but earlier on, I was trying to explain that there's this kind of there's a rhythm it's an interesting thing and it, it's kind of an unconscious thing and it's only in retrospect or someone else points it out but there's a rhythm to the dialogue and then you find there's a there's a rhythm to the music and it, if you you know in something as conspicuously as it, it's we've chosen a particular um tone to this film and that is rhythmical and so the dialogue moves to a rhythm and then the music uh moves to a rhythm and what happens is is in the edit you think oh I, I fancied that tune and actually it doesn't work that well so then you stick on another track and then in the end what you're what you're really after is this oscillating rhythm um and there are those nostalgic tunes that you're familiar with roxy music tune which by the way how great is that tune you know and it who knew roxy music came up with that it's you know it's rather fabulous so you, you dig through stuff, really looking for a rhythm. All right. And it's funny because you asked that question, and then there were murmurs throughout the audience of, like, I wanted to ask that question. So good, good question. You get the, so far, question of the day. All right. The guy that I sort of made fun of for being the first question. All right. You, you get the second question. Great film. Um, so my question is kind of for Hugh and for Guy. Uh, Fletcher was kind of like telling the story or narrating the story in a way. Was there a difference or was it different for you acting when you're kind of narrating the story or directing him versus the other actors and characters in the film? Uh, it's quite an interesting question because it, in part Hugh's role grew during the construction of the narrative and that's informed by uh, Hugh's ownership and possession of the role. And because he found his way into that, I just thought, hold on, this, is, this has got to be a bigger role. Because it was smaller than that. And it was really him and his, as I say, his ownership of it, that when, oh, hold on, we, sh we need to flush this out. I'll let you carry on from there, Hugh. Yes, well, th that may be true. That's very nice. What I remember is that uh, 
I learned 40 fucking pages of dialogue, um, <laughs> which took me, you know, I'm old now, it took me weeks and weeks and weeks. But I had it absolutely in my head, turned up on the first day, and Guy Ritchie said, no, we're not doing any of that, here's some new pages. And uh, I said, I can't, I can't, I can't learn any new stuff now. That's not exactly how you said it, actually, Hugh. No, it was, <laughs> it, it was tenser than that. Uh, and the guy said, don't worry, we've got a teleprompter. I said, teleprompter? I'm, I'm not a newsreader, darling. I'm an actor. <laughs> so there was a, a little standoff there. But I, yes, I, I mean, I did, I did, I have to, I was a functionary as well. I, I helped to sort of stitch things together. Even in post-production, I came back and put some sticking plasters between bits, didn't I? Yeah, yeah but again, it's because Hugh's momentum, uh, amounted to such a, a force that it, that character, and it's curious, isn't it, how, his, how repulsive he is and how attractive he is in sort of equal measure, but that just, that, that's to do with a combination, I suppose, of, of the director and the actor, but in no small part because of the actor. Uh, it kind of draws me back to the cerebral question, Matthew. Um, Weed? <laughs> Not that, the other one, that was the, the, the other question. It, it's just the, um, uh, we're talking about the, the rhythm of, uh, of a, a Guy Ritchie film, yeah. right? And it's, it's, it's not like it's a, it's a playbook, but there's a very distinct style, and I think it's partially driven by the, by the uh, music, but it's also driven by the dialogue and the, the, the cadence of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And is that, so can you talk at all about getting into that, is that something that's driven by a guy or is that something that's just inherent from the material itself? Well, you see it in the material and you see it in Lockstock, you see it in Snatch, but after that, and I, and I have a lot of nonverbal cues, and, mm, yeah, well, mm, no, none of that will be in a Guy Ritchie film. It's, it's get rid of the legato, go with the staccato, um, very succinct. Nouns, verbs, end, in punto, in sync. That's it. Clear. Clarity. Um, and then he's also, guys, I think that's what he's listening to on the side. He, 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 many scenes, we talked about it here where we'd get in, we'd start the day, you sit around the table and you read the scene. And a guy would be like, oh, geez, that shit, who wrote that? And you're like, well, you wrote that. And he's like, well, we're not using that. And he comes up with another idea. And he just listens. Or he hears something. He goes, that's not working in his ear on that day in that moment, not five minutes ago, right now. Sometimes he's directing and uh, the dialogue's not fitting his meter during the scene. And he'll yell out something in the middle of the scene or keep the camera rolling and throw something out. And that, was, that started off to be, uh, for me, in the beginning quite frustrating. Because um, like you, I spent some, spent some time working on the, the, the lines and having my story down. But very quickly, what happened for me with Guy, and I think for most of us, um, besides you, um, is that Guy's ideas in the moment, for the most part, are better. His, his rewrites in the moment are, for the most part, better than what was there. And they're obviously inspired by what was originally written. Um, so you have to be very uh, agile. Um, and it is a different music. But once, for me, once, he, once, once I got the click of the music he's listening for, then I just tuned into that. And then and, and we had a pretty good idea what was going to work or what, what wasn't going to work. And is that, is that, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the cast. Is that, is that true for everybody else? And, and also maybe expanding on that, is it always the uh, extemporaneous guy voice that's rewriting or is there anything in the, the script that came to the fore from uh, your own experience within the material? I'm throwing that out if anybody has any ideas. Well, guys, wide open. If, you, if you've got an idea that sticks or you throw it out there, but it, don't even, it's better not to even talk about it, actually. It's better to just do it in the scene if he likes the, what it sounds like. Yeah. You've moved on and he didn't even bring it up because it, 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 it worked. I, mean, I, have a, I have a story of um, there's a scene where we go down to the dock, and uh, I think that must have been my third or fourth sort of day on, on set. And as you do, you come prepared and, and, and ready to rumble and... Guy's there waiting on the dock, and uh, I approach him. He's like, oh, all right, Henry, how are you? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good. He's like, all right, 
fuck the script off. This is what we're going to do. You're going to come over here. You're going to tell him. And he's like, go over, figure out what we want to say, and we'll come back in. We'll, we'll make it a little bit more proper. And so it's, it's truly a collaborative experience. And I think some of the best one-liners and the best moments come from the inspiration from where you are and in the environment and, and the, uh, the set itself. So um, you just have to, as uh, McConaughey says, just be nimble. You got to be agile. I think you want to keep the uh, creative process active and anything you can do uh, in part to keep everyone uh, awake, right? Uh, so as the more active it is, the more interactive it is, the more live it feels, it feels in the moment. And, you know, it's funny because rather embarrassingly, I just watched this film and rather embarrassingly, I enjoyed it. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that I completely forget what I, I, as I'm watching it, I'm trying to work out the plot. So I may have constructed the plot, but I've completely forgotten about the plot. And... I think you sort of want to hold on to that as you're making the movie that you, you want to keep it active and you really you don't want to f think about the rem rem a remembered past or an imagined future. You just want to be in it when you're in it. And so uh, you can construct this whole thing. But the truth is, is that the, the gold comes from the moment when you're there and you're trying to construct it. And that is a collaborative process. And really, I suppose my job is to encourage everyone to dial into a frequency, because once you've dialed into that frequency, everyone has a lot to offer within that frequency. Uh, so I, I, got the, I got the notice from, from the wings so that it is, it is time to end our time. So I have, a, I have a, a, what I would say is a, a poor question to end things. Uh, but it might not be. Uh, but I'll stop I, I, now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to remind the audience also, so we're going we're gonna to have one more question. Um, and, uh, but as we're going to be leaving the audience, these guys have to get out and get to their hotels. So I want to ask everybody to stay in their seats so they can get out and uh, um, safely get to bed because they have a long road of publicity ahead. Um, but uh, um, so the question is about look and feel and style. And I'm wearing maybe not the greatest uh, facsimile of a Guy Ritchie universe. But uh, what really struck me was Coach and his squad and their uh, their track suits. And everybody was defined by like a very distinct sense of style. Uh, do you have a do you have a a team that works with you on on the look of the costumes? Is there any input from the from the gang here as to uh, what they think that that particular character should be once they're in the fold? So how, how does that process work for you? Um, again, I think that's all part of the frequency, and I think it's all part of what in, what the actors want, or you want. And once you dial into that frequency, honestly, it's like steering the head of the tiger. It's you know what a good idea is, you know what a bad idea is if you are paying attention at the time. And I have to tell you, I like those tracksuits. As I was watching that, I thought those tracksuits are good tracksuits. <laughs> they are good tracksuits, and not commercially available, my friend. That has to be a custom job. Well, actually, Mr. Bill Shit. Block, who's the producer out there, will tell you they are commercially available. <laughs> Not in Austin, Texas, my friend. <laughs> they will be soon. I mean, soon. <laughs> well, uh, I got to say, I had a blast with this movie, and I have one more assignment for this group and for the 13 cities that are also watching. Uh, you know, we, we built this theater uh, to support movies that we love. And, uh, you know, movies, you know, there's Star Wars. Everybody's going to like Star Wars. And, you know, Frozen made a bunch of money. It's your job to be part of this team. If you love this movie, tell your friends the old-fashioned way, social media, around the water cooler. Say, go and see the gentleman because it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, there, there's a hashtag, right? Somebody, somebody have a hashtag for me? Oh, it's just right up there. Man, all right, so that's enough for me. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for our director Thank and the extraordinary cast of The Gentlemen. Thank you guys for coming, and spread the word. And now let's give them a minute as they peaceably exit.